Christ is born. Christos Rasdaitya. I don't know if you were paying attention in the gospel, but if you were, you might have noticed that it didn't flow very well. There were actually several readings that we heard tonight. And our liturgical tradition that even if we're reading from more than one gospel, they're all rolled together as one reading. Suffice to say that baby Jesus has grown up during the gospels that we heard tonight. We hear about his beginning. We hear about his circumcision. We hear about him being found in the temple by Mary and Joseph. And then all of a sudden he's preaching. That's about 30 years worth, we figure, all in one day. So this is, without a doubt, quite a strange Sunday for the church. Because we are celebrating the feast of the circumcision of our Lord. We're also preparing to celebrate the feast of his theophany, his baptism, uh, next week. We are celebrating the feast of St. Basil the Great, who went to his heavenly reward on the Feast of the Circumcision. Um, We hear the gospel of the finding in the temple. We hear of the naming of Jesus, which is very important. And it's New Year. So we really do have quite the hodgepodge. And I'm not quite sure what to do with this hodgepodge except to possibly say a little bit about each aspect of it. So circumcision, first of all, was still at the beginning. He's still a baby. And as everybody knows, it's absolutely fundamental to the Jewish religion that males are circumcised. And yet in the reading that we hear from St. Paul to the Colossians, he says, you also were circumcised by the circumcision not administered by hand, but by stripping off of the carnal body with the circumcision of Christ. So, as we all know, at least... um, for the very first days of Christianity, Christians are not circumcised, at least not religiously. It's not part of our religious practice. But nevertheless, we're all called to be circumcised spiritually. And Basil the Great, we're told beautifully in the Vesper service, by his generous practice of virtue, O Basil, you subjected the passions of the flesh to the spirit. You renounced the flesh, the world, and the princes of the earth. That's how our circumcision happens. When we, through our practice of virtue, when we subject the passions of our flesh to the spirit, that is spiritual circumcision. And we're told that St. Basil, the great Archbishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, in Asia Minor, that he, as well as being an amazing theologian, he is also a man of great charity and great virtue. And we will hear some of his theology. I will sing it for you as we sing his liturgy tonight. But as well as being this amazing theologian that's considered one of the three holy hierarchs, the three great pillars of our Byzantine tradition, of our Eastern spirituality, he was a worker of good deeds and a worker of charity. And somewhere here I have a quote about that that I wanted to read to you. Um, St. Basil's most famous quote about loving others is this. That bread you hold in your clutches, that belongs to the starving. That coat you keep locked away in your closet, 
That belongs to the naked. Those shoes that are going to waste with you, they belong to the barefooted. The silver you buried away, that belongs to the needy. Whomsoever you could have helped and did not, to so many have you been unjust. So one thing we can definitely take away is the importance to imitate St. Basil in our new year. Let it be a new year of charity, of giving to those in need. In fact, to emphasize this, there's a Greek tradition of giving out special loaves with valuable money inside. And you can cut it into pieces and give pieces to different people who are in need. It's not so much the giving of a loaf or the giving of bread, but the giving of what we have surplus. Basil isn't saying give your own coat away so that you're freezing cold. He's saying give away the coat that you don't need. So maybe this new year, maybe it's time for a giveaway. Maybe it's time for us to let go of some of the stuff that we don't need, but other people do. Christianity is always very practical, as well as being amazing philosophically and intellectually, as Basil the Great was. So Jesus is circumcised and given his name, the name of Jesus. And we're told that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, both in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. The name of Jesus is very, very powerful. It's the most powerful prayer there is. And I remember a Mexican woman telling me, I don't know how to pray. How do I pray? She'd never really been brought up in the church. And I thought about trying to teach her the Our Father from my Spanish cheat sheet. And I realized that this was going to get nowhere. And she said, I don't know how to pray. And I know the name Jesus in Spanish, Jesus, Jesus. And because my daughters used to watch Dora the Explorer, I know, Ayudame, help me, Ayudame. And uh, thank God for the Dora the Explorer because she helped me teach a lady how to pray. Jesus, Ayudame, Ayudame. That is the, really the only prayer that you need. And of course, as Byzantine Christians, we all know the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus, Ayudame. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And we repeat that over and over and over again until the prayer of the name of Jesus lives within our hearts. So this is a more important feast than we might give credit for. And remember, you don't need long and complicated prayers. Jesus, help me. Jesus, I put my trust in you. All these are very powerful because of the holy name. And also because that name is so holy. It's the name of our Savior. Don't ever, please don't ever take that name in vain. We all say some cuss and curse words from time to time, but whatever comes out of your mouth, never pronounce that holy name for the wrong reasons. You know, I was, I was kind of disappointed because I was in Walmart just before Christmas, and there were these teen girls going at the top of their voice, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And I take my collar off, but I'm fumbling in my pocket trying to find it so I could put it back on and be like, hey, that's my friend you're talking about. <laughs> but uh, I couldn't get it in time and I missed my opportunity to freak them out. Maybe it wasn't the, <laughs> maybe, maybe it wasn't the right time. But let us always use that holy name with reverence because it's the name that's given to us for salvation. Indeed, that's what it means. It means God saves. So let's be careful with his holy name this year. So even though in the gospel today, Jesus has grown up, he's still a baby all the way through to the feast of the presentation. 
It's Byzantine. <laughs> what can I say? In the sense that Byzantine sometimes means things you can't understand. But it does mean that in our new year, we can still hold on to Christmas. We can still hold on to the Nativity. All the way through to the Feast of the Presentation at the beginning of February. So let us not put Christmas away too quickly. Let us keep our trees up. And even if today we hear of him as a 12-year-old, let us continue to hold to the joy that our Saviour has come to the world. It was again from Colossians. Paul tells us, I have all of the readings printed out here, and here we are. For in him dwells the whole fullness of the deity bodily, and you are complete in him, or rather you share in this fullness in him. This blows away so much human philosophy, and especially ancient Greek philosophy. And the Gnosticism that plagued early Christianity and still plagues Christianity today, it's the one thing that does not make sense to other religions and other spiritualities, that the whole fullness of the deity bodily dwells in him, and that therefore you and I are complete in him. That you and I can share the fullness of that in him. Earlier, Paul reminds us, do not let yourselves be taken captive by empty philosophies. But see to it that no one captivate you with an empty, seductive philosophy according to human tradition, according to the elemental powers of the world and not according to Christ. There's all kinds of spiritual and philosophical garbage out there that says all kinds of interesting, sometimes even helpful, maybe inspiring things. But when you start to compare them, you will see that all of them disagree about exactly who or what Jesus Christ was. Certainly, they all perhaps agree that he wasn't the fullness of the deity in bodily form. And indeed, in the New Testament, we're told, any spirit which does not acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of Antichrist. And there's lots of spiritualities which say good things about Jesus, they all actually disagree amongst themselves as to who or what Jesus was. But none of them agree that he was God in the flesh. And it's exactly the same with the resurrection. Maybe he wasn't dead. Maybe he wasn't really human. But the concept of Jesus rising from the dead as a human being can't cope with it. Don't be let yourselves led astray by all the spiritual and philosophical nonsense that is out there, rather hold on, even through February, of the truth that Christmas gives us, that our Saviour has truly come, that God himself has truly come in our human flesh and sanctifies our flesh and sanctifies us so that in the new year we can lead like St. Basil the Great, circumcised lives of charity and prayer in the fullness of the godly nature that Christ has given to us. So let us simply promise ourselves and promise Jesus Christ that in 2023, we are going to be closer to him than we were in 2022. And that in 2023, we are going to do more for Jesus Christ than we did in 2022.
Christ is born.